uh, today. <laughs> we, <clears throat> we are delighted to have uh, Dr. Eric Bargloff uh, with us as uh, our featured speaker. Uh, Eric Bargloff is the chief economist of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, prior to joining AIIB in September 2020, he was the director of the Institute of Global Affairs at London School of Economics and the chief economist of the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development from 2006 to 2015. He's an expert in transition economics and institutional transformation through private sector development. He holds a PhD in financial economics and an MA in business and economics, both from the Stockholm School of Economics. Now, uh, he will speak uh, about, uh, a, uh, about the state capacity and private sector mobilization toward net zero in emerging economies. So, the Eric, the floor is yours. Well, I very much uh, enjoy being back at uh, ADBI and I've uh, been here a few times over the years. Uh, actually, I even came here once um, as a student and, and uh, I've always enjoyed uh, uh, the conversations here. And uh, of course, we, we work uh, a lot with uh, uh, ADB in, in Manila and I have very uh, regular monthly phone calls uh, with uh, uh, my counterpart there, and so I, I was very much looking forward to this opportunity to to uh, to develop uh, our relationship here. So I will talk uh, a little bit about our uh, latest uh, flagship report, but I also want to use this opportunity perhaps to say something about uh, the kind of, of data sets and so on that we have that could possibly be uh, uh, something that we could. Uh, we could share and, 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 and uh, possibly uh, look at uh, some opportunities for, for uh, uh, cooperation uh, in, in, in the future. So that's very much the spirit in which I, I uh, want to uh, approach this. And, and of course, AIB is, uh, as you know, a new institution. I'm the first uh, chief economist and, and uh, I am um, uh, tr trying to build this different kind of uh, uh, chief economist uh, department, which, which is very much relying on, on uh, collaborations uh, with uh, other institutions and uh, trying to have a lean core, but then uh, develop a deep long-term relationship. So maybe we can find a way to, to work with uh, ADB, ADBI in this uh, spirit. But so, so much for, for uh, preliminary uh, remarks. Uh, let me come to the topic, uh, which I think is, is um, uh, very much on, on uh, on the mind of, of uh, uh, many Japanese uh, policymakers from what I've seen now in my, during my uh, stay here in Japan. So uh, let me share uh, my screen and, and uh, give you a... So... Okay, well, great. So... so um, like four weeks ago, I, I was in Sharm el Sheikh in in, uh, in Egypt, and uh, uh, as you know, there was the COP twenty seven climate conference, and uh, the, the lead up to that was quite acrimonious. It was a, uh, a lot of accusations from uh, emerging and developing countries uh, about the costs imposed on them by climate change and the the uh, constraints uh, that were at least uh, implicitly imposed on them in terms of their growth path uh, and uh, their possibilities to realize their potential because of climate change, which is something that they had very little role in, in, in creating. And, uh, and they, were, of course, they were asking for compensation for loss and damages, and they were asking for, for exemptions from, from uh, uh, these uh, various rules that are being put in place to, to push the net zero transition and 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 we, this report that we have called moonshot for the emerging world uh, we are trying to 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 say yes this is a very legitimate complaints uh, and and these countries deserve uh, these compensation for these uh, 
damages that have been caused and these losses have been caused by climate change. But the likelihood that they will get this kind of compensation and the likelihood that they will realize their potential despite these constraints uh, is much greater if they can form sort of coherent uh, policies and, and create uh, the environment where, where the net zero transition can, can be actually implemented also in, in their country. So this is what we are trying to, to provide with this report. And of course, I know that ADB and ADBI have, have, have done a lot of work uh, in this space. So, and I, I just saw that you had a very recent conference on this. And, and so you'll take this uh, as you know, one attempt to bring together a lot of different uh, work in this area and a lot of experience from, from uh, advanced economies and, 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 and from some uh, emerging and developing countries and, and, and trying to, to sort of distill what we think are the most important elements. So, so um, just give you a, a few um, uh, remarks about, the, uh, more remarks about the context. So, of course, the, the other side of this very negative debate is that what is actually happening on the ground is that uh, these countries are falling behind in the net zero transition because there's not a lot of political appetite to, to implement this uh, transition. Uh, there is uh, not the resources and of course COVID has uh, further uh, restricted their fiscal space and so on. So net zero transition is not happening fast enough and, and there is you know, a very large a fossil fuel footprint in many of these uh, economies. I'll come back to that uh, in, in some uh, detail. And uh, we see very little of, of green innovation and adoption of green technology. So that's you know, what, what is uh, the reality uh, in, in this country. And against that background, we are trying to uh, advance this, what we call a moonshot uh, mission-oriented approach. Of course, moonshot has been used you know, quite a bit in, in advanced economies and, and uh, maybe even have become a little bit of a cliche in, in those settings, but actually uh, it hasn't been used to the same extent in, in emerging and developing economies. And, and you could say maybe uh, there's a good reason why it hasn't been used because it, of course, requires a lot of state capacity to, to um, uh, think in these terms and, 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 and try to implement this type of, of policy. And, and of course, we know that often in, in these countries, uh, state capacity is, is in short supply. So that is gonna be the challenge that we are kind of facing. We, we know that uh, the net zero transition is uh, arguably the, the, the greatest challenge to state capacity everywhere, but particularly in these countries where it's in the shortest supply. So we need to enhance the state capacity. And you, you saw that the subtitle was, uh, you know, uh, uh, building state capacity and mobilizing the private sector. So it's really about, on the one hand, transforming state institutions in order to enable and crowd in the private sector. So the primary thing is to, to create the state capacity that allows uh, to bring in uh, the private sector, creates the condition for the private sector to play uh, the positive role that it needs to play in, in order to, to bring about uh, this transition. And I'll be much more precise about that in, in a minute. So, so just to give you a sense of what we have in mind and, and sort of summarize the, the main messages. So, uh, you know, so the moonshot of course goes back to um, the uh, sort of goals that were set by uh, John F. Kennedy when he talked about the, 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 the aspiration of the U.S. To, to go to the moon. And it was about setting up this very ambitious aspiration and, and this goal and then bringing together all the institutions that the, that, uh, the uh, US uh, sort of commands, the US government commands, but also bringing the private sector, of course, bringing together uh, uh, research uh, capacity, uh, civil society capacity, and so on, to achieve that one objective. And, and that is, I think, what we see as sort of the central uh, point and, and then using all these tools. So the first element of this is uh, to use these state-owned institutions uh, from that today are laggards and are 
really uh, slowing down the net zero transition, make them leaders and, and make use of the capacity that they have to, uh, to both raise um, capital and to raise capital actually cheaper than, than the, the private sector and, and, and use that to uh, achieve uh, these objectives for the net zero transition. The second element is the to bring in the private sector. So we talk a lot about private sector capital, but it's also, of course, about private sector skills, private sector experience, private sector energy and dynamism. But in order to benefit from that, uh, we need to have the conditions have to be right. And I'll be more precise, but it's, of course, about competition policy. It's about procurement. It's about uh, having robust contracting and so on. So, all those things need to be in place for the private sector to play the role. And, and that is in itself is about state capacity. So the way, the way we think about it is that you create the state capacity, you allow the private sector to come in and, and, and benefit from the good sides of the private sector. And then in turn, by engaging with the private sector, you build further state capacity and you want to get that virtuous cycle going. And, and that's the sort of core to this uh, uh, way of approaching uh, the uh, net zero transition. And of course, then we know that we need a lot of new technologies. Uh, the International Energy Agency calculated going through all the national determined contributions that there are 100 new technologies, 50 of them are in the market, but they are not really scalable at the moment. And 50 of them are, are um, not in the market even. And, and you know, we're going to need them to be both in the market and scalable uh, if, if we're going to achieve what, what countries have set out in these national determined contributions. And, and you know, how are we going to do this? Well, I think it's not realistic that most of these technologies and, uh, and, and genuine innovation will happen in emerging development countries. But what, what's happened there is the adoption and, and, and absorption of these technologies. So we need to think about how we create frameworks that really allows uh, this to happen. So that's the third element. The, four, the fourth element is related to that, and uh, which is you know, setting a meaningful carbon price. And the, this is maybe now generally accepted in, in advanced economies, but still very controversial in one, many emerging and development countries. And, and, and you know, it also requires state capacity to, to implement and, and sustain and, and, and particularly uh, uh, keep in, in, in place uh, when political pressures uh, build up and so on. But the, the carbon price is important not only because it helps uh, influence consumption, uh, both in, uh, among consumers and, uh, and also, of course, in, in, in among producers, but also very importantly because it gives incentives to, to innovation throughout the economy. So absolutely critical that one uh, carbon price is, is uh, part of this uh, moonshot. But carbon price will not be sufficient. Uh, it will not uh, allow us to move as quickly and as uh, effectively as, as we need. And we need to have uh, uh, this kind of mission-driven coordination. But the problem is, of course, that that's exactly where state capacity is, is most challenged and where the risk for capture, risk for, for um, uh, corruption and so on is, is the greatest. So we need to really think about how that mission-driven coordination, how we design that. And I'll come back a little bit to that later on. Finally, and but absolutely not the least important, and uh, you said earlier that I worked a lot on transition, and, and I think this is a much more general point around transition that you know, for transitions to be sustainable, and, and we see have a lot of experience from this, particularly from the transition in Eastern Europe and former Soviet Union, that you know, countries that paid little attention to to the social dimension of that uh, suffered later because uh, uh, transition uh, was reversed or, or devia uh, deviated and, and so on. We need, we need to make sure that this is an in integral part of, of, of the policy and, and it both gives predictability for people so that they know uh, how they can uh, de develop their, their lives, and, uh, but also that it's fair. And, and, and those things are, are very important elements. So, so for, to, to become very concrete, and, and you know, this is not the full Monty, so to say, this is not the full um, uh, moonshot, perhaps, but it, it, it's an example of, of the kind of thinking. So, in, in uh, Sharm el Sheikh, um, the Egyptian 
government uh, uh, announced something called Nuefi, which means something like welcoming in Arabic. And um, it was a, a platform, a country platform. Uh, we talk a lot about country platforms uh, these days, particularly in the climate space. And, and the, this is a, kind of, a, a platform there. They put a lot of, uh, or basically all their uh, uh, planned renewable projects in solar and wind. And by doing so, uh, uh, provide visibility to the pipeline uh, that they had and, and uh, allowed uh, producer equipment, for example, to get a sense of what, what's there, allowed uh, multilateral development banks to look at, you know, what, where can we be part of uh, these uh, projects and, and so on. So that visibility is quite important uh, to, to, and also, of course, to get, make sure that these are compatible, you know, these, uh, projects often require a lot of integration with the rest of the energy system. So having them all on the table makes it uh, uh, sort of easier to, to, to think through those uh, systemic issues. So having that as uh, one component, the second component is to have a, a program for, uh, for phasing out fossil fuel assets and, and also integrated with that, uh, it is just transition program with compensation to workers in the fossil fuel sector uh, with um, uh, training programs for, for these workers and so on. That's an, a, a component of this. They have a number of partners. Uh, EBRD has been sort of the leading partner, but uh, AIB is part of it. European Investment Bank is part of their other partners too. But uh, this, the idea with country platforms is to bring together the, the different development partners of countries, the multilateral development banks, but also the, the national development banks, the development agencies and so on. And this is what they have done on this uh, NUEFI. So how is this financed? Well, obviously it comes from these uh, development uh, institutions, but also some concessional finance from the US to help uh, with these uh, just transition programs. And, 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 and that's you know, a very valuable component. Uh, a second uh, interesting component, an innovative component is that uh, there is a, uh, this performance linked debt from, from Germany. So the, the, the debt conditions are affected by uh, the, the achievements by, by Egypt on the climate targets. So this is a, a very uh, promising and, and, and a very interesting, very fast uh, development area of finance, uh, this uh, sustainability linked uh, instruments or performance linked instruments. And, and that's an integrated part of this, uh, of this particular uh, platform that uh, Egypt has created. And, and finally, and this is uh, incredibly important, I think, for the future of these uh, uh, programs and, uh, and net zero transition in general, is that we must move the production of, of some of these uh, renewable inputs uh, to the emerging and developing world. And by creating this kind of uh, uh, visibility around what, what, will, what investments will be made in renewables, it allows uh, the suppliers in, in, of equipment. And now one German producer of, of blades for wind power has announced that uh, it will start uh, producing in, in Egypt. And that I think is exactly what we need to, not only to, is it good from, from sort of a, a, a economic point of view, but it's also a very important thing, a political point of view to create more legitimacy around these um, uh, net zero transition. So th this is sort of the, the, I think you have now got the, the main messages of, of, of the report and, and uh, the, uh, what I would do now is I will go through some of the elements in, in, in more detail and then hopefully give you some sense of how, how we have come to this and, and what the analysis behind is. And then I was gonna let my colleague here, uh, Ying Yi Gao, um, say something about uh, the, the data sets we have been using and, and also maybe offer some opportunities to, to maybe collaborate and using some of the, or, or um, exploiting together some of the work that we have uh, done to bring together different data sets and so on. But, but let me um, go through very, uh, relatively quickly uh, what, what we have done and, and then uh, see if we, we can have a discussion around those possible ideas. So, so as I've said already, that state capacity is really the core uh, that we um, 
we think is so essential and then of course this is interesting also because it is not different from what we have been saying when it comes to more traditional development uh, messages and and uh, i i was before the summer at this meeting of heads of, of uh, uh, development agencies from around the world and and the, most of the discussion was about you know now we have to make all the sacrifices uh, in terms of development assistance because you know you're telling us we have to support climate uh, mitigation and adaptation and the message here is really there's no real conflict because the, you know the the state capacity building is something that we have been saying for a long time is key to any development uh, policy or any growth oriented policy you need to create the basic conditions uh, to uh, to allow uh, states to to raise fiscal revenue to invest in in future growth oriented uh, policies and so on so so i think that is a, a very important and positive message from from uh, what we we uh, uh, say in this report and and of course state capacity where does that come from well it really comes from if the creating trust in government and creating a sense of common interest. And here we think that they're actually the climate uh, change is providing a, a new opportunity to build that sense of common interest that actually everyone in society is, is affected by climate change. So of course, it differs a lot and some groups in society and some countries have more uh, capacity to protect themselves and we need, but everyone is affected. We need to, to give a sense that everyone is, is uh, is protected against uh, the impact of climate change and then also have an interest in in uh, in, in building resilience and in, 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 in reducing uh, climate change so so that's uh, i think the, the foundation of, of, of state capacity and, and and of course also explains why why we think this uh, net zero transition has to have this just transition as a very important component mm -hmm. So, so once you start thinking about, you know, so what does state capacity really mean in, in this, um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, what, what is it that these, what capacity do these countries have? Well, they have uh, these state-owned institutions that they at some level own and, and, and control and, and these institutions, they are important because they uh, raise a lot of uh, capital, they raise capital uh, cheaper than the private sector and and actually this gap between the state and the private sector in terms of uh, uh, cost of, of capital is greater um, in emerging and developing uh, uh, economies than in, in in advanced economies and you know we we can argue why that is i think we understand why that is and it may be a good or a bad thing but it's it's a fact and we should try to use this to to push the net zero uh, transition and and the same thing with this state-owned financial institutions, which um, you know many uh, you know which exist in, in in different forms in in in, uh, in all countries, and you have of course the state-owned commercial banks, but you have the national development banks, it's very important in some countries, and, and of course very different in terms of how well they function and so. On. You have the sovereign wealth funds and and. With a lot of potential to to use and uh, to, towards uh, these kind of objectives, and and by the way, which also have to protect themselves against uh, the impact of, of uh, climate risk and so on. And and then of course you have the central banks, which are you know, playing such an important role now in the transformation of the financial sector in, in many uh, uh, advanced economies. They are also a very important potential actors in, in the net zero transition in developing and, and emerging economies. And, and we know that these are often you know, bastions of, 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 uh, of state capacity, in, you know, often islands of state capacity in, 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 in countries with, with weaker institutions. Uh, that's where a lot of the most talented people end up and that's where you can start building something. So it's, I think particularly important to think about the role of central banks here. And of course, these state-owned financial institutions, they can think about larger projects with longer tenors. They can become very important partners for the private sector. But unfortunately, when we look at what, what they actually do, uh, they are 
heavily overinvested in, in, in fossil fuels in oil and gas. And, and here you're comparing uh, SOE investment to private sector investment. And you have this, you see the same thing when you look at the state-owned banks. We hear data set in. I'll say something, or I won't say much about, but Ding will say a little bit about the data set because I think there's a lot of potential in the data we are using for, for looking at a lot of different uh, things. And, and um, uh, we put a lot of work into to merging uh, these different data sets and, and uh, we would very much like to see it uh, being used um, for for so the public good so so but here just uh, looking at the transactions uh, uh, by sector and and where there is at least one uh, sob lender state-owned bank lender and one where there's no state-owned bank involved and you can see that oil and gas is, is more more important so again it suggests that these uh, state-owned financial institutions are are more exposed in in, in the fossil fuel sector and 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 so taking that first point that we had on the net zero uh, uh, moonshot uh, taking that to what does it really mean going from laggards to leaders well it is trying to get out of this artificial distinction in many countries so in india for example the whole renewables have been built by the private sector and then you have this the kind of state and the uh, state-owned institutions all in the fossil fuels sector and, and all the co connections there and, and the uh, skewed interest to, to uh, maintain fossil fuel subsidies and, and, and so on. And, and uh, if we, that has to be broken. And, and very encouragingly now, Coal India, for example, have started investing in renewables. As there's, Yes, we have to worry a bit on what that uh, maybe some state-owned institutions can undermine incentives for private players and so on. But that we need so much, so much more activity in uh, if we are going to achieve the goals of the net zero transition. That we, we should really push state-owned institutions into this into this uh, area, and, and we need to find ways of you know, providing incentives for that. Uh, we. These institutions can become very important uh, in, in helping to green value chains, both production value chains. Actually, our last year's uh, uh, flagship report focused on, on the greening of, of global value chains, because that's going to be, I think, the most important determinant of what we produce, or where we produce it, how we produce it. It's much more important than some of these short-term things that we have been focused on recently. And, and here, there's a role for state-owned enterprises, state-owned financial institutions, and of course, also looking then at the financial value chains, there is a, a role for state-owned institutions to, to, to look at that. Uh, they can be very much involved in, in mobilizing private capital, again, uh, ensuring that the, the, the sort of conditions are right. And, and, and part of these conditions being right is, is that we need to have uh, governance reform. And of course, we have been calling for this governance reform for, for many years. And, uh, but here there is maybe a chance because of the kind of imperative of, of a net zero transition to really get an additional push for these uh, reforms to happen. And I think in general, many of these uh, reforms and uh, suggestions, policies that we are advocating here are part of more traditional uh, development policies. But what we argue is that the, the, the imperative to move on climate mitigation and climate adaptation gives an, uh, additional push and maybe can help us make progress that we have not been able to, to make uh, over, over the years uh, on this agenda. And of course, SVE and public banks can be very central to you know, bringing about collaborations and coordination uh, across value chains, which will be essential to achieve this objective. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, here's a, just, I guess this slide is just to show that, yes, the private, we have private participation, there are PPPs, and, and they have increased in importance in, across uh, different uh, segments of, of infrastructure, but there's still, you know, a lot of room, for, uh, more room for, for private uh, uh, investment here, and, and, uh, and, and, and we, 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 there are some 
you know issues that that we we need to think about when we bring in the, the private sector we need we need to think about the, the regulatory framework we need to think about uh, the procurement we need to think about how we manage contract here's a, a, a very simple uh, graph but just showing the importance of regulation the this is when you, you set electricity tariffs um, by determined by the um, the most efficient producers then renewables uh, wins out and and i think that you know it's a very simple message behind that so we need to make sure that we have the right regulation in place obviously competition also helps to bring about uh, that outcome and we know that renewables are particularly complicated in, when it comes to contracting and and uh, there's a lot of delays and there's a lot of renegotiation we need to make sure that that um, that we have a robust state capacity that can deal with with that and, and that all that is to ensure that when we bring talk about bringing the private private sector using their capital their their skills and and their uh, experience and also their capacity to to transform the state we have uh, these basic uh, things in place and of course still speaking and, and you know AD, adb and adbi of course, are very familiar. These are the kind of things that we are looking for when we are engaging in, in uh, with uh, companies in, in, in individual sectors. But I think it is particularly important in, in this uh, net zero space. Uh, very quickly, some words on uh, on on innovation. And I was going to leave uh, uh, a little bit of time for for Jing Yi to, to say because he's worked on on this. Um, uh, data set that, that we have uh, used uh, for um, analyzing patent uh, patents in, in the green technologies and but I want to show this slide just to illustrate how little innovation and it's not surprising of course that the, there's very little innovation in uh, the emerging and developing world in, in, in the green technology space as measured by by patenting China being an important exception but um, and, and but of course we shouldn't expect them to have this kind of genuine new innovation uh, they they uh, these countries should focus much more on you know imitating adopting absorbing uh, technologies developed elsewhere but uh, it's still interesting i think to look at you know how this is happening so maybe ding you do want to say a few words on that Okay, thank you, Eric. I'll be very quick. So basically, we uh, uh, analyzed the patent data using a global database from uh, all these intellectual properties. So as you can see in the slide, this is only an overview of uh, the ana analysis that we did. But uh, in the background, we look at uh, nine different technologies, green technologies adopted by the methodologies from the WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization, basically including uh, solar, wind, hydropower, hydrogen, and also carbon capture and storage data. And we uh, look at uh, the patent from the perspective of number one, the nationalities of the applicants. So uh, apparently, uh, as you can see, uh, UK, EU, China, Japan, and Korea, and also US always uh, are the top uh, arrangements of these applicant uh, nationalities. And also we look at the data, not just uh, look at the patent application, not just from the number of applications, but also the total market valuations of the patent value. This is, I, I believe it is not used by many other uh, organizations so far uh, in terms of using uh, the patent value as an indicator uh, for, uh, for patent application. One particular um, fi finding we observe from the data is that uh, for China, for example, maybe the number of uh, applicants of these patents are very big, but when it, when, it, when it comes to the value of this patent, actually it is still uh, lagging behind uh, major economies such as e EU, uh, US, and Japan. So uh, in the report, we have a lot more details about how we uh, look at these uh, green technologies from those nine subsectors we analyzed. So maybe you can take a look at the report. And also, this is just a very brief summary of the sectors of the four select uh, sectors that we uh, analyzed. So basically, what we found uh, is that why 
uh, advanced economies, they tend to have much higher patent values in green technology. Number one factor is that, of course, they might have, it has something to do with a stronger uh, legal protection environment in these economies. And also um, the biggest applicant in green technologies of these advanced economies, they tend to be the global firms who have the ca capacity to file applications in patent offices around the world. And uh, um, I will stop here and uh, we'll let uh, Eric to move on for the slides and we can come back to the data part at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, yeah, one particular sector we focus on is the carbon storage and uh, capture technology or CCS, uh, because th this topic has been uh, studied by many other organizations when it comes to the next zero uh, topic. So uh, basically, we uh, concluded, uh, we find that number one, uh, uh, international collaboration is uh, very important for uh, the carbon, for the, for the CCS technology to scale up. So for example, and also public finance in financing the CCS technology is also very important. Uh, there are several studies uh, 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 conducting in US and Japan, also China, uh, find that in order for the CC technology to uh, be scaled up at a affordable cost, uh, the government and also, or uh, public finance should, should focus on the uh, building of a, a network pipeline of these uh, CCS storage and uh, capture centers around uh, the places where the emissions are high. And another uh, particular finding that we also notice using the patent data is that if you look at the top applicants of the CCS technology uh, around the world, the top applicants uh, tend to be uh, one the the top uh, the great the biggest uh, fossil fuel companies around the world. So apparently. Uh, these fossil fuel companies uh, in the era of uh, net zero, they want to file uh, the technologies in CCS to um, reduce their carbon footprint uh, in, the, uh, in the future. So this is one message from this slide. I'll stop here. So to summarize the, the um, uh, innovation part of this, uh, of this presentation that you know, we shouldn't expect in emerging developing countries to see uh, most of uh, uh, you know, much of these uh, genuine innovation things that are new for the for the world as a whole but but really the focus has to be on, on a uh, imitation adoption absorption of, of the technology developed elsewhere and you need to develop a kind of framework policies uh, and institutions that, that support that and and carbon pricing is an absolutely essential element of this to to provide uh, innovation incentives but it's not not sufficient and and what what we also have and i think this is some a role also that we have as as mdbs is to ensure that that the countries these countries really have access to 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 technology for these technologies and then also of course help with, with finance but we have to fight uh, efforts to to restrict uh, the, cir the circulation availability of these technologies um so, so yes, a, a few more words uh, before I conclude on on on, uh, on state state capacity. Because uh, you know, you, you can say you know what is it exactly that we mean when we say we're going to build state capacity? What are the kind of institutions that we think are are core in in uh, for the net zero transition in in emerging and developing countries? So, I think we. We have sort of selected three uh, aspects or three um, uh, dimensions of, of, of state capacity. The first one is, is credibility. So credibility is about the, you know the ability to 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 uh, to implement and, and and sustain policies over time. And uh, we know that in infrastructure investment, really uh, policy risk is is uh, probably the greatest risk um, and. Um, and, and of course, we know in renewables, this has been a very serious issues in many countries. So, uh, and, and maybe the, the most important credibility here is around uh, emissions pricing and, and reducing fossil fuel subsidies. We have seen now, and we had this spike in, in prices uh, uh, after the war on, on Ukraine, the, uh, 
many countries have stepped back in terms of their commitment to to reduce fossil fuel subsidies and so on. So we need to find ways of, of really locking in and 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 and. and looking at the mechanisms to, to, to lock in uh, emissions pricing and, and, and establishing markets that, uh, that allow uh, these prices to be formed efficiently. So the second component is, is uh, the coordination. And, and, and here I would look at the institutions that we have in many advanced economies that, that we call them climate councils or, or, or uh, net zero councils and so on that, that try to uh, bring together uh, evidence and, 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 and monitor what's happening in different ministries and different levels of government and so on, and, and um, produce uh, you know, new research, uh, try to uh, make sure that, that uh, this uh, debate around what's the right balance between different elements of the net zero is kept alive. So establishing such a body can be uh, extremely valuable. It has to have a certain independence. Uh, to, so I think this is something we, we think is, is doable and, and uh, critical to, to, uh, to uh, state capacity building. And we, we think it's important to build these islands of, of expertise and, and particularly uh, concentrate knowledge around assessing uh, green technology and, and, and you know, green technology adoption, find, finding, making sure that we have uh, sort of centers of excellence in, in countries that, that allows uh, you to select and, and, and uh, prepare different parts of, of the economy for integration of these green technologies. So those would be kind of three uh, elements of, of, of course, a much broader agenda, but, but just to, it could be helpful to, to, to use these uh, broad uh, aspects to when you start to thinking about what is the architecture that you're trying to establish in a particular country. So, so I don't think I, I, I'm conscious of time here, probably I, I should uh, conclude. We have uh, three chapters that go through um, uh, th uh, three countries. So it's India, Indonesia, and China. India, I've spoken already about what I think is the most striking thing in India is, is as you know, the, they have the net zero uh, goal by 2070 uh, announced uh, by Modi in the head of Glasgow last year. Mm. I think it's fair to say there was not a lot of preparation in, in the uh, sort of, uh, Indian uh, society for this uh, announcement. And, and, and there have been some questions about how, how uh, thoroughly has it been prepared and so on. But uh, it is there. And I think uh, I was uh, in Delhi in the beginning of the summer. I'm going there next week. And we are going to do a, 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 a large study of, of, uh, of the net zero transition in, in uh, India. I think it is a, a, a serious commitment and, and should be uh, very much uh, supported. And that, uh, if you, you, you just need to have a very quick look at, at uh, the uh, for example, the, the fossil fuel intensity in individual sectors, and you see huge variations between state-owned enterprises and non-state-owned enterprises, also within these different groups. So there are some low-hanging fruits there. And, and um, you, the, the private sector has, as I said, been very involved in building uh, re uh, renewables, but uh, we now need to get the SVs involved as well. Low carbon transport is just in the very, very beginning, and that's going to be a very important part of, of developing India's um, uh, net zero transition. Uh, the green finance is very much at, at the beginning, and, and uh, there needs to be much more particularly involving the private banks. We need to get more FDI inflows and, and green bonds and really uh, you know, getting uh, green bonds uh, that are truly additional and, and uh, and, and really uh, helps to, to push uh, the green agenda is important. In, in Indonesia, probably, I, I, uh, here we really focused on what they have tried to do in terms of SV reform and creating these holding companies. But when you look at the actual outcome in terms of, of uh, renewables, it hasn't really caught on. And, and uh, they have a lot of PPPs, but they haven't really managed to, to bring it into uh, the um, uh, to uh, in net zero transition. So there's a lot of work to do. And there's now been, as you probably know, uh, 
uh, a lot of work between the International Energy Agency and, and the Indonesian government, and they have now a, a much more um, careful um, plan than, than when we looked at, at, the, um, at their uh, efforts uh, earlier this year. Uh, China, there's a lot to say about China, of course, and, and China was a bit in the same situation when uh, Xi Jinping announced uh, the 2060 objectives in, 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 uh, in the UN General Assembly, and uh, much of the country was in some state of surprise. And, and, but uh, I think it's fair to say that now there is a, a lot of activity going on in, in different parts, in all parts of, of Chinese society to try to, to make this happen, but there's, of course, a lot of resistance. From, from different parts. But what we focused on was more on the history of what can we learn from SOE reform and, and, and uh, other reforms in, in, in China. Well, one thing that we saw that the privatization efforts uh, had been very effective when it comes to improving efficiency in, in, in of, of SOEs, but uh, had no impact on, on environmental performance. But once you started doing these evaluations, uh, or once you start including environment in the evaluation of SOE managers, you know, these are very important for determining the careers of managers. Also, you know, as since they move across enterprises and across enterprises and, and, and financial sector and also government, these uh, evaluations are very powerful. And they, uh, once you start involved in including environmental, you can see in, in the data, and we, we show it in the report, uh, a very clear, uh, improvement in terms of uh, SOEs when it comes to, to the environment. Um, I've also done a lot of work on trying to uh, take into account the different state capacity of different uh, provinces in China in how they implement the PPPs and how they uh, allow uh, different forms of PPPs. I think there's some interesting lessons there as well. Um, yeah, I can say a lot about the emissions trading system. It's just in the very beginning. Uh, prices are not um, very high yet, and, and only 40% uh, of the economy is covered. But there are some interesting lessons I won't go into. Them. So, yeah, so let me summarize here. You know, we have a, a trying to argue that we need this kind of mission driven policy framework to, to really make credible that if money now is transferred to emerging developing economies as part of, of uh, loss and damages programs or, or, or uh, with other uh, motivations, there need to be a credible policy frameworks in place. And they should start with the premise of building state capacity and, and reforming the SOEs and uh, state-owned financial institutions and to help and, and empower them to help lead uh, this term session, mobilizing the private sector, creating the right conditions for the private sector to, to play uh, their critical role, uh, develop uh, technology adoption frameworks that are really adjusted to local conditions, what these uh, economies uh, really need, facilitate globally the, uh, in order to grant access to finance and technology, ensuring that this is a smooth and fair uh, transition. And of course, you know, for for a new bank, um, uh, these are also there are some messages here. I won't go into them now, but uh, uh, obviously we have been working a lot with uh, ADB on uh, and benefited a lot from uh, collaborations with ADB on on uh, on different um, on, on on projects that we could never do on our own, and uh, and a lot that we are talking about here, building state capacity. I think so. You know, we're, we're, there are projects where we are involved uh, in where there's significant components of state capacity building, but we have here benefited very much from working with ADB and working with uh, the World Bank. Uh, uh, and, and But we think that this is something where AIB has to become much more active, sort of expanding around the infrastructure project also viewing state capacity as sort of infrastructure something that has to be built uh, over time for infrastructure to really be uh, as effective as, as possible and, and particularly for the uh, the green dimension of this uh, infrastructure project to be as effective as possible in mitigating and, and uh, adapting to climate change so we want to say just a few words about the data and so on maybe 
for kind of setting up what we hope it can be fruitful discussions in, uh, between us, maybe in a more informal setting uh, around the, around potential collaborations and so on. But just to give you a sense of what uh, data work is behind here and what kind of data work we are we're undertaking. So maybe Jing Yu, you can say some more, more work. More work. Me, okay, sure, thank you. Uh, I'll be very quick. Um, so, <clears throat> For this report, we used a lot of like global databases uh, as listed in this uh, annex. Uh, for example, the biggest effort we spent on is to find out a global database of state-owned enterprises. Basically, we <coughs> we use a combination of data sources such as uh, OB's firm financials. Basically, what we did is to try to connect uh, try to use a uh, method to identify SOEs by the ownership type and, and connect to their financials and also the patent database, which is also uh, owned by uh, OBIS. So we, our team in the economics department spent a lot of effort harmonizing and we figure out a, uh, a global SOE database. Uh, we are happy to share if you have any uh, research ideas in the future. And also uh, on the China chapter, we have a constant collaboration with external uh, scholars within China. Uh, for example, in this year and also last year's reports, we collaborated with a, a professor from uh, <coughs> from university in Beijing, and she helped us to get, us, get access to survey data and also customs, uh, customs export data, which is very granular, and we're happy to uh, make more use of it in the future. I'll stop here. <coughs> Yes, uh, on the IG Global Data, which is a long, uh, long-term subscription, which uh, it is a trans, uh, it is a transaction uh, level data focused on uh, infrastructure finance uh, projects. So we uh, we usually look at uh, we usually use it as a as a data supply to our investment operations team when they have any questions about uh, the um, infrastructure and finance market. Of course, in this report, we use IG Global Data to find out uh, the differences between SOE firm um, uh, investment in infrastructure and also you, for other chapters. In, the, in our report, we have more details and feel free to look at the report. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Eric and Jingyu, for an excellent presentation on this very important topic, of course, some very interesting new data as well, which we'd we'll be eager to find out more about on that. And um, we have some time for a Q&A now. I can see a few questions in the Q&A box. Um, perhaps the best thing to do is for me to collect a few questions and then you can reply all at once. Um, so is, if Sita Ram is there, you, you you may ask your question directly. Please go ahead, Sidram. Thank you, John. Um, thank you for the excellent presentation. Um, this is more of a kind of a philosophical question, but uh, forgive me for asking that. Uh, you know, the net zero emissions entail, uh, as you have listed, a lot of patented uh, technologies that will need to be employed. and. Uh, these are perceived by developing uh, countries, uh, particularly Asian countries, uh, as technologies that are either expensive or they won't be able to create or develop those technologies by themselves in the near future. So either they will delay or they will not be able to embrace policies. This is further reinforced due to the pandemic experience where many countries could not access vaccines because they were just so expensive for them to book and purchase. Mm -hmm and the patents were not easily available to them uh, to make uh, generic on their own. So they have learned a lesson and they are not easy to forget. So these forward thinking ideas, how realistic, what are your thoughts on what could be done from multilateral mm -hmm. agencies and so on to really make a step forward? Thank you. Please go ahead. I think this is a, a very um, relevant. Can we mute? I think we are. I know. Yeah. So, so, um, uh, so, so this is, you know, I, I made several references to to the need to provide greater access to these technologies for for emerging and, and developing countries, and and you know, I don't think we have any you know, revolutionary uh, new ideas for how this uh, will happen, but I think it's something we need to 
to focus on because uh, uh, it has to be part of of somehow the um, the kind of ethics of of, of, of these uh, policies that if we talk about loss and damages uh, it's not just about uh, you know paying money uh, providing capital we, we also need to help uh, them uh, bring these technologies that will help to address the the problems that uh, the developed world uh, created for them so i i think it is uh, uh, as you said it's a philosophical it's a moral issue that uh, you know you you we, and that's why i think the vaccine uh, example that you gave is has uh, is, is not just a a, a, um, a random example because i think there were very important uh, moral issues around how vaccine technology was shared or not shared and and uh, i think there are, it's not not exactly the same but but i think there are some similarities that we are we have a, a responsibility and uh, i think to share these uh, technologies in order to minimize or reduce the impact of a problem that we have created for them and and i think that moral uh, dimension should be part of the consideration so, you know i mean we know all the the, the, the debates here you know about uh, you know if we reduce uh, the protection the patent protection so on we reduce the incentives to to innovate and so, but and, and and of course i think some of that argument those arguments go, go away i think in, in the vaccine discussion because uh, there, there were, it's about saving lives and then saving lives in, in the short term but here i think you can I think you can make similar arguments. We have a time restriction. We need to address this global issue, and and uh, it, all hands on deck, so to say. And we need to uh, maybe make some, perhaps even even uh, calculated sacrifices in terms of long term incentives in, in in innovation in order to to get uh, short term ben benefits here. But but. Uh, yeah, I think it's a very good question, and I don't have, as I said, any, uh, you know, patent, <laughs> patent, uh, patent, patentable uh, solutions here, or, or, or very original solutions. But just the the kind of moral argument that you make, I think, is one that should be made, and and, and uh, should uh, we, we should we, have, we should think very hard about how we can do this. And of course, have, we have a very important role. Uh, I think what, what has struck me is, is I joined AIB two years ago, and what has struck me where I think AIB is a little bit different perhaps than other uh, development banks is this very strong focus on, on, on technology and, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, and, and the realization that infrastructure actually across uh, among all sectors have been the sector that uh, has been the, the, the least uh, capable of integrating new technologies and, and so finding ways for MDBs to play a role in, in that matching you know, new high-tech uh, firms and, and more traditional uh, infrastructure firms, I think that's an important role for us. So we have created some platforms for that. Maybe also in the future, we'll create some physical space to, to make that happen and so on. So I think those are things that we should think about as, as MDBs uh, as well. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Eric. There are two more questions in the Q&A box, which are somewhat related. Um, and, and these are um, linked to challenges faced by international organizations and state-owned institutions in really uh, leveraging private sector investment. Um, so I wonder if you could spend 30 seconds to a minute in, in response to that, given the time, Eric. I'm spending all my time now reading them. <laughs> so, so um, so, so, what is the question exactly? So, so, um, uh, either from the public, or from the private sector, or something. I agree with everything. Uh, uh, how how do we overcome these uh, these attitudes? You know, I, I think I think the 
there, again, there are no simple solutions. I, as I said, there is a potential, I think, uh, from climate change to create, uh, or, or climate change creates uh, a sense of, of common interest, a potential at least of, of common interest, because take a country like uh, Pakistan. Now, so many people, like one third of the country in, in area and, and you know, a very significant part of the population is affected uh, by what happened there. And then the, and of course, everyone in, in Pakistan, I think have become acutely aware of, of the potential for, for future similar catastrophes. And, and the, it's that kind of, of imperative that I think will be important for uh, making sure that, that uh, we get out of that uh, business as usual uh, state of, of thinking and and, and uh, where I also I think moon that's why I liked the, you know, we, there were some skepticism about the use of the moonshot concept but I, I think the moonshot is exactly to try to say you know we, 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 we cannot approach this as, as business as usual we have to think about all the tools we have and, 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 and try to find ways of, of, of applying them to achieve. Uh, this particular outcome, and and the, I think we have a unique opportunity here to to actually achieve very fundamental development outcomes because of the imminent uh, risks that that uh, we are actually seeing here just in, right in front of. Us. Yeah, and it was it was it the second the second question? I haven't. Yeah, I think we're more or less out. Of time now, but um, the, I think the second, the other question was somewhat related to the to the one you just answered. Um, it was about challenges faced by state-owned enterprises and how to best leverage private sector uh, finance for transition towards net zero investment. So um, I think you've more or less covered that in your previous response. So um, that brings the seminar to a conclusion. So thank you very much, Eric and Jingyu, for an excellent presentation. And uh, yes, we very much hope for collaborative work in the future with ADBI. Thank you. Bye-bye.